Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode 619. What your doctor doesn't tell you could save you thousands of dollars on medication. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your host is Dr. Kathy Moffat, medical director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging. Dr. Maupin is the author of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the award-winning book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of testosterone replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. Today we're going to talk about um, a problem that many of us has, and that is that we are spending too much money on our medications. Many of us take between one and five, maybe ten medications a day, or if it's weekly, then you could, uh, it's one medication for seven days or one medication for, for a month, but it's still many different medications that your doctor's not going to tell you about how to save on those because he or she doesn't think about that. That's not part of their, uh, of their training. They think, well, you've got this symptom, I'm going to treat this symptom. You've got, say, chronic pain, I'm going to give you one medication for that. You've got migraines, I'm going to give you three medications for that. One, to prevent them, and two, to stop them when they start. That's, that's an example. Well, all of those pile up, and then you end up with a handful of prescription drugs that you have to take all the time. Each of those drugs costs money, and there's always a filling fee from the pharmacist and the monetary um, cost of the drug, and drugs are getting more, more and more expensive. So many times our doctors deal with one problem at a time because they don't have much time in the office. So when you come in, you say, I want to talk about... Mm, my migraines. And you talk about migraines, and then he gives you prescriptions for that particular problem, but he doesn't really know or she doesn't really know about all the other problems that you have because you haven't had time to go over them all. So he'll center in on this one problem, give you the medication for it. Next time you come in and say, I have, um, I have swelling. So he'll treat swelling with one or two medications. In the end, after you've been to him or her a couple times, you've got a handful of medication. So one of the things I think would make our medication uh, use a lot better is if we could look for medications that treat multiple symptoms. And this is not easy at this point because doctors don't have allotted time to see patients that actually gives them the luxury of looking at all the problems the patient has and trying to solve those problems, maybe two or three of the problems, with one drug. So having said that, and knowing that it is difficult for these physicians uh, to do this, uh, we just have have to accept that that's the way the world is right now. However, um, you can look at your medications and your symptoms a different way. You can write all of your symptoms down, all your medications that you have been prescribed for those symptoms, and then all of the the diseases you might have, like diabetes, and all the medications you take for that. When you give that to your doctor, he or she will be able to kind of tie all those in and possibly find one medication that helps two or three symptoms, such as... um, If you have weight gain and you have prediabetes and you have insulin resistance, the one medication that would help you for that is metformin. So you would be treating three separate things along with diet and exercise to help you with those three problems, both symptoms and and diseases. Now, why why we don't look at this is because there's a time problem. Sometimes doctors don't do a lot of extra study after they leave medical school. So if they're out for 20 years or 10 years, then there's probably been 50 new drugs to cover the diseases they most commonly take care of, and they're not up to date on them, so they just use what they've always used, which might be one drug for each symptom. 
Um, other times, doctors only follow the guidelines that are given to them by their specialty. Like I would be, uh, since I'm an OBGYN, I only practice GYN, uh, and really just a part of GYN, which is hormone therapy. But it, under my fellowship in American College of OBGYN, or ACOG, they, tell, they give you a list of things that are guidelines to treat certain problems. And those guidelines um, are usually out of date at least 10 years. These organizations are huge. It takes a lot of time, money, and energy to change a guideline. So it, and it takes a lot of research to back it up to change those guidelines. So what we find is that when we're following those guidelines, we're m way behind what the new research has given us and the new information that should have come from that new um, research. So following guidelines means that we're behind the times. Um, then most of, most of the medications have side effects that are not common, common or um, common knowledge to doctors. So when we have lots of side effects to a drug, in general, we're not going to list all the side effects to our patients because either that means if I say, oh, you're going to be on this drug and you're going to gain weight, you're not going to take that drug. And since I want you to take it for that specific problem, like taking GABA for, or G-A-B-B-A, GABA for pain, and, it's, and it causes you to gain weight. Why would you take that if you're trying to fight, you're fighting weight gain? So you won't take it for the pain. And that's not what the doctor wants you, to, wants you to do. So sometimes they don't know the side effects or it's a rare side effect or it's a side effect like this one, which you would choose not to take the drug because you don't want that side effect. Um, it takes a lot of time to go over side effects for drugs. And since doctors have very little time allotted to them for each visit, then they in general don't have time to go over all the side effects. Um, one of the things that I deal with every day is that there are um, many side of, excuse me, many symptoms and many diseases that occur when you stop making estrogen for a woman. Uh, that's called menopause. But there are so many symptoms related to just this halting of estrogen. And there are many diseases that follow that such as when you stop making estrogen, they found that you become insulin resistant or pre-diabetic. So every carb that enters your body literally becomes fat instead of using it as fuel. So that's something we know about estrogen. We also know that if you don't have estrogen, you have hot flashes, a dry vagina, painful intercourse, dry skin, hair loss in the front of your head. Um, and all of those symptoms are related to a lack of estradiol or estrogen. Because estrogen controls so many things that if doctors would just replace estrogen, and my choice is a non-oral estrogen because there's so many side effects to oral estrogen, but a non-oral bioidentical estrogen like I do, I use pellets and I put them under the skin and they slowly dissolve over four months for women. That is one treatment that is going to solve a multitude of problems and give you very few side effects because we're just giving you back what you lost. If we can do this, then we can decrease your rate of diabetes. We can decrease your rate of uh, weight gain. We can make you comfortable. Uh, we can also keep you from having painful intercourse, which will then help you with your uh, marriage relationship or your, or your uh, significant other. So that's Another way that you can think about this, replace what's missing. That's a very simple concept. And it would decrease the number of drugs that you take because replacing what's missing will then cure all of those symptoms and problems. However, when we're talking about bioidentical hormones, then drug companies can't patent the hormone itself because it's natural. It's it is actually what your body makes. So they can't patent it. They can patent how it's delivered, like a patch, or they can patent um, a delivery system like they did for men for testosterone. They patented the delivery system with pellets, but it has to do with the, um, the instrument that you use to slide the pellets in, not about the pellets themselves, which are pure testosterone. But you can't 
patent the estrogen or the pure testosterone. So what happens is the drug companies can't make money on it. The pharmacies that make it can make money, but the drug companies that um, are big pharma can't make money on it. So they look for all kinds of other medications that they can use to treat the symptoms of menopause or low testosterone. So they look for medications like um, one of the symptoms is a vag vaginal dryness. Okay, so instead of just taking estradiol as a patch or a pellet, they say, oh, well, we can give you um, lubricants. So they made a whole bunch of different lubricants that are supposed to give you back the same kind of wetness that you had when you were younger, but they don't. They're not the same. They're not, they aren't equivalent. They don't, uh, they just don't uh, match up to what you're used to. So you still will have problems with the dry vagina. They, or if that isn't the, if that isn't what they recommend, then they re recommend vaginal estrogen. Well, okay, vaginal estrogen can be patented. And so um, they have you put vaginal estrogen every other night or every night into the vagina. That causes problems because if you put it in before you have intercourse, then that cream is going to get on your partner and that is not good for him or him. He is then going to absorb it and when men absorb a lot of estrogen, they get man boobs, they get belly fat, and their free testosterone, or the testosterone that actually is doing something, uh, decreases. So you can actually cause your partner to have ED by, by having estrogen in your vagina. It may help your vaginal, um, vaginal wetness, but it's not helping your partner. But more importantly, it's not helping anything else in your body. It is not taking over... Uh, it doesn't help your hot flashes. It is not helping your um, your skin. It's not helping the frontal hair grow. It is not doing all the things that estradiol does because it's only in one place. It's a local application, and all it treats is um, is dryness of the vagina so that you are comfortable when you have intercourse. So you can see all the problems here. If we just went back to giving estradiol um, for the whole body, basically, by using a patch or pellets, then we would solve these problems without multiple drugs. Well, there's another option for estrogen, which I don't consider an option. Um, it actually isn't an estrogen. It's called a SERM, S-E-R-M, which is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. So basically, it works instead of on giving you estrogen, it works on the, the part of the receiving end of the, est uh, of the receptors. So on all your tissues, you have estrogen receptors. So it basically blocks those. Now, that's not going to help your hot flashes. It isn't always going to help your dry vagina. It is not going to help your hair grow. It is not necessarily going to help anything except it'll prevent you from getting uterine cancer. Well, we use progesterone for that. We don't need to have this that's going to cause a lot more problems than it's than it's all than it is going to treat. So I basically keep that off my list completely. But you can see the problem. You could use one thing that is natural and like what your body used to make, or you could use all of these other things and you're still not fixing all the problems or all the symptoms. So having said that, um, there I have another example. And that's one that stimulated me to do this, uh, this health cast. And that is, there was an article about the drug GABA, which is a pain reliever. Um, and this was in the Journal of American Geriatrics. And it was done by Alan Brett, MD. In any case, he, has a, he did a study um, about the prescribing cascade that occurs in older patients when they have, um, when they're treated with GABA. Now, You've never heard about GABA, but there are a lot of patients now on GABA for chronic pain. So GABA does treat chronic pain. However, it has multiple side effects. One of the side effects, and that's what this paper is about, is that it causes your lower extremities to swell. Well, that's one of those side effects that patients notice after they start it. They call the office to their doctor, and they say, I'm swelling. And they say, oh, I'll give you a diuretic. So they are then on GABA plus a diuretic. So they're on two drugs instead of one because most people get swelling with GABA. Now, 
One of the uh, side effects that doctors rarely tell you about is that before you go on GABA. The other one is weight gain. So when we have patients in our office and one of their complaints is weight gain and they're on GABA and I'm going to try to help them lose weight, giving them yet another drug without changing their GABA to something else doesn't make sense to me. You have to, you have to actually stop the drug that's causing the weight gain and then work on weight loss. So uh, I try to ex I explain that to patients, and um, they honestly don't didn't know that that had any um, any effect on their weight gain, and they're not at all happy about it. Now, why did they change get changed to GABA? Well, people used to be on narcotics. Narcotics are to some people addictive personalities. They are um, habit forming. People who aren't addictive aren't going to be, they aren't going to have a habit, they're not going to get addicted to this, but people who do have an addictive personality will. So they try to, they, the government and the FDA and the DEA want us not to write narcotics. And they check doctors and they follow their prescriptions and, and they're, you don't want the DEA, the FDA walking in your office and saying, oh, you're using too many narcotics, you must be pushing pills. Or, you know, you must be doing something that is wrong. When a patient has pain and they aren't addictive and they need a narcotic, oftentimes they've come to the end of their diagnostic and treatment road. There's nothing else we can do. Either they can't have surgery for some reason or there is no surgery to give them for this kind of pain or they have used other things that don't, that don't work and the only thing that works is a narcotic that places the doctor at a risk for still writing that narcotic. So oftentimes the reason doctors don't write the thing that is most obvious to work is because they're afraid. They're afraid for their own license. And I understand that and I would be afraid for my own license if I had to write that too. But what this is doing, this pressure on doctors to not use these drugs ever, is, because, is causing doc doctors not to write pain medicine when they're they're needed. Like people after a hysterectomy, after uh, big surgeries, orthopedic surgeries are being sent home with Tylenol. I mean, that's not really a pain reliever. It's kind of, as far as I'm concerned, um, it's more of a placebo. It decreases your temperature. It keeps you from having a fever. But for pain, real pain, that's not even close to enough. So surgical pain should be managed with some kind of narcotic or tramadol or um, toradol or some other kind of pain medicine that actually gives pain relief. So we have a whole group of people in the United States who are not getting the pain relief they need because the government has uh, created a world where doctors who prescribe what they need will, um, will be disciplined. So there's a problem there. Doctors can't fix it and patients can't fix it, but the powers that be, the government could fix it if they made it more reasonable for some patients to be able to still get these medications. Um, when I looked at the side effects for GABA, um, the side effects include um, more than just not getting your pain handled. They include Fatigue, swelling, we talked about, mood disorders like depression, even suicidal um, thought, back pain. Well, many people who are on GABA have back pain already. It's going to make it worse. ED, erectile dysfunction, and impotence. So those are the side effects to GABA, which are not the side effects to uh, a narcotic or tramadol or toradol. So these are things that that could cause, so here we are, we're making, we're making a decision to use that for pain and then we're going to have to use uh, Cialis or Viagra for the patients that get ED. We're ha going to have to use an antidepressant um, or Celexa or one of the other antidepressants or antipsychotics for the mood disorders. We're going to use an, um, we're going to have to prescribe a diuretic for the swelling. For fatigue, nah. Basically, it's hard to treat fatigue with a medication unless you're, um, the patient is 
able to take some kind of stimulant. And then weight gain, you have to use weight gain medicine, and there's all kinds of different weight gain medicines. But this is by taking GABA and not taking a narcotic, you're going to end up with four or five other drugs to treat the side effects of that one medication. This, this is all a big problem. My, one of my solutions for that is to look at the symptoms that low testosterone uh, per, causes in both, both um, sexes. So I look at the symptoms for low T in both sexes, and the symptoms are many things that people who don't think about hormones being the cause will then give a different kind of drug to, So, such as um, low T causes sexual dysfunction. When we replace T, testosterone, we then usually get good, really good function in women, and about half the time, maybe more, we get good function in men. Sometimes men need to have better uh, blood flow, so it's a, it's a, a two-cause problem, so they may, may need not something for blood flow like Cialis, but it's not because of, it's a side effect of testosterone, it's just that testosterone may not be completely enough. Um, low testosterone also causes fatigue. When we give people testosterone back, their fatigue gets better as long as they don't have some other, um, some other hormone um, in, uh, malfunction or uh, deficiency. Uh, insomnia. Insomnia is a side effect of low testosterone. If it's the insomnia that starts when you're over 40, uh, then it is usually linked to a low testosterone, and giving you testosterone gives you better sleep, longer sleep, and you don't wake up in the middle of the night and stay awake. Uh, testosterone helps chronic pain. It, it raises the, uh, the bar in terms of your uh, pain threshold. So it has, it's more pain. For you to feel it, you have to have more pain. So it basically makes you more pain resistant. Um, testosterone loss causes fat gain and muscle loss. And those are things that we don't really have another treatment for besides diet pills. But for muscle gaining, you have to use testosterone and, and, and use exercise and uh, weight training to get those muscles back. If you just use weight training without testosterone after you're 40, you're not going to make much muscle. Uh, if your testosterone is low, you're not going to make much muscle. So you have to think about that if you're not making progress in your weightlifting. Um, so here's some of the examples of what, how we treat these symptoms. Instead of just giving testosterone to somebody and wiping out all these symptoms, um, for insomnia, we give a patient Ambien or clonazepam, two different medications. Clonazepam is controlled. Uh, for cro chronic pain, we use narcotics or NSAIDs like Motrin, or we use Tylenol, or all three of them. Um, mood disorders that start after 40, like depression that starts after 40, or um, mania that starts after 40, oftentimes that's secondary to a lack of hormones. So we could give one hormone, or we could give an antidepressant, plus or minus an antipsychotic, plus or minus an anti-seizure drug, maybe all three, to help that mood. Um, migraine headaches. Migraine headaches, uh, if they occur after the age of 40, and or they occur associated with your period in females, then uh, replacing testosterone and replacing estrogen are the uh, most efficient treatment Otherwise, you would have to um, use three uh, migraine medications, one to prevent them from occurring, and then two, usually, to help you stop it once it's uh, in progress. Um, oftentimes, when we don't have enough testosterone, our immune system is not very good, and we get everything that is out there, which is not healthy, and, and in, the year, in the years of COVID can mean... Um, death or disability. So when we tell, you know, our doctors we have immune, immune problems, we're not, we're not uh, able to get better and we're getting everything that comes our way, they just throw their hands up and say, well, we don't know what to do with that. They don't have a treatment for that. But testosterone does help your immune system. It increases your T cells, helps you fight infection, stimulates your thymus. So there is a treatment. They just haven't linked it up with uh, hormones yet. To, um, to prevent heart disease when you have high lipids, 
we often will um, put you on a low cholesterol diet plus uh, a statin. Well, statins um, will lower your cholesterol, don't necessarily lower your risk of heart disease, and we've now found in the recent past that it is carbohydrates, not uh, cholesterol-containing foods, that cause high lipids. We've also learned that high lipids don't necessarily mean heart disease. So oftentimes, we just have to get someone on a good diet, get their hormones replaced, estrogen and or testosterone, or both if they're female, so that they can that so you can then uh, be healthier and your lipids will start coming down. That and I will ref, refrain or I will rephrase this. If you do have high cholesterol before you go on a statin, I suggest you get a cardiac calcium scan to see if you have any plaque. If you're over 40 and you don't have any plaque but your lipids are high, then I suggest you don't go on the statin. I don't think that that is going to help you. Sometimes if you have high cholesterol, it doesn't mean that you're going to get plaque, and that's the only reason we take a statin. And lastly, there are many diseases that um, we can prevent by taking our hormones, but we don't necessarily have a treatment for, such as if we take estrogen and testosterone as a female, we can delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease by 10 years for the estrogen and 10 years for the testosterone. So if I was going to get Alzheimer's, and my timetable would have me getting it at 70, then if I take these hormones as pellets, then I'm going to have, as pellets or patch, then I'm going to have a delay by 20 years. Well, by the time I'm 90, something else might likely get me, uh, but it's still 20 more years that I have of my life that I, I will be able to remember things and be able to interact in a healthy fashion. There are many different diseases that start when our testosterone and our estrogen drop. So not only is taking those two hormones when they get low healthy and preventing multiple illnesses, but they take the place of multiple drugs. So you can see that you might even replace 10 drugs by, by taking your estradiol and your testosterone if you're female or by taking testosterone if you're male. So. This is, this is not something that I expect you as a patient to do anything about, but um, except to talk to your doctor about, well, if I, if I took, replace my estrogen, could I not take these drugs? Some of the things that I gave you as examples. And it is one of the problems that we have in this world of having a seven minute to 10 minute doctor appointment. It doesn't work for treating more than one problem. And, and many of these problems are tied together and need to be put together before they can be treated with one thing. So do yourself a favor, be efficient, try to get your uh, estradiol and your testosterone replaced, and avoid taking all of these medications, and you will be much healthier uh, when, when your life goes on and you are not restricted to um, throwing pills down all the time. So thank you for joining us. Hopefully, we will have another exciting subject like this next time. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth.